As someone who's been using Photoshop for five plus years now, there's definitely some things that I learned way too far down the line. So in today's video, I'm gonna be sharing with you five things that I wish someone told me when I was starting out with Photoshop. Now this video isn't just for beginners. If you've been using Photoshop for a little bit longer, you're a bit more of an intermediate, then still stick around and watch the video the whole way through because there's definitely gonna be some things in here that you didn't know. Without further ado, let's get into the tips. So for our first tip, one of the best and most powerful features in Photoshop is going to be smart objects. Now, smart objects are essentially layers within layers that allow you to modify your objects without losing any important data. So when you're applying things like filters, adjustments, effects, all of these get saved to the smart object and you can go back and edit them. You can go back and tone them down, change them, tweak them whatsoever. You don't ever end up actually flattening it onto that layer, which is super useful when you're doing things like composites with lots of different layers and elements and stuff like that. What you can actually do is actually paste a layer into a Photoshop document, even if it's not a mock-up just into a Photoshop document, convert it to a smart object and then open up that smart object which will open up as a new Photoshop document. Edit, add layers, do whatever you want within this smart object and all you have to do at the end of it is just hit save, go back into your original document and you'll see that it is updated with the changes that you just made in this smart object. Now this is super useful for mock-ups or if you're trying to make something look like it's in context, maybe you're sending different versions of revisions to a client and you want them all to be in the same mock-up on a billboard or something like that. Another thing that I always use smart objects for especially when I'm designing thumbnails is to the smart filters that apply to it. So when you apply to a filter to a layer normally, it flattens onto that layer and you can't edit it. However, if you put a filter onto a smart object, you'll notice that it comes underneath it as a smart filter. And what you can actually do is double click on the text here and you can go in and change the values that you set for that filter. Or you can double click on the little sliders icon next to the text. And this allows you just to actually tone down the opacity of that effect on the layer. Now this is super useful because if you've got multiple different objects or layers within Photoshop and you want them all to have the same filters on, what you can actually do is apply those filters to one layer, hold Alt or Option if you're on Mac, and drag them onto your new layer. The other layer has to be made a smart object first, but you can just drop these filters right onto it and it'll apply the exact same effects. And then if you want to go and tweak them from there, you do it the same way where you just, just double click on the text and go in and change those values. So smart objects is my first tip of the video and it's honestly probably one of the most powerful ones in here. If you can start using smart objects, it's probably gonna speed up your workflow and also just make your life a lot easier. And maybe you can maybe even open up some doors to make some mock-ups and stuff like that. Now, tip number two is another super powerful tool within Photoshop and this is layer masks and I cannot stress how much you want to be using layer masks rather than erasing and again flattening stuff onto your image. When you're working in Photoshop you want to work really non-destructively and the best way to do this is using layer masks. All you have to do to add a layer mask to a layer is whatever layer you're selected in Photoshop come down to this button right down here it looks like a square of a circle cut out in the middle of it click that and it will make this little box appear next to your layer this is your mask. Now layer masks work with grayscale so anything black will completely erase whatever you brush over with your layer mask, anything white you can add back in. So what this allows you to do is erase around edges, make those cutouts really super clean. And if you happen to erase too much or you actually don't like what you've erased, you can just switch it back to the white color and brush it back over and you've got that layer there. Now what this allows you to do is erase stuff really non-destructively. This is not just for making cutouts, you can do plenty of stuff with layer masks. Sometimes if you've got some glass and you wanna make it a bit transparent, what you can do is add a layer mask to the layer with the glass where it looks quite opaque and you can't really see through it. Get a gray kind of color and just brush over the glass and it will make it slightly transparent so you can still kind of see through it but you can still also see the color and the texture of the glass. Now you can get super, super creative and honestly, I probably be only scratching the surface of how you actually use layer masks in Photoshop because anything on that grayscale colorway, you can use anything. You can make filters, different kinds of brushes, anything you can do on a normal Photoshop layer, you can do in a mask. And the last part to layer masks, similar to smart objects, you can actually copy these layer masks onto other things. And if you want to move it around on the layer separately to the actual layer itself, unclick the little chain in the middle and you can move this all around separately. Now moving on to tip number three. Now I've only recently discovered this tip myself, but honestly, it's such a lifesaver when it comes to color grading and editing and all that kind of stuff within Photoshop. And that is the selective color adjustment layer. Now, I know a lot of you guys probably know what camera raw filter is and I'm sure you know about the color mixer in there and changing the colors of stuff and the, the tones of things. One of the most powerful things that I've actually found is combining the selective color adjustment layer with layer masks to really get facial editing right for thumbnails and stuff like that. I'm gonna throw up some footage on screen of just showing you the difference that one selective adjustment layer can work, but essentially how it works is, as the name entails, you can select a certain color within an image and edit those. You can edit only the reds or only the yellows or only the blues. And the way it works is you'll see all these colors here. If you slide them further to the right, it adds more of that color to the color you're editing. So for example, if I've got the yellow selected and I slide the cyan all the way to the right, it's gonna add more cyan to the yellow tones in that image. 
image. Same with blacks at the bottom. If I swipe it to the left, it's going to take away black or add white. So it's going to make it lighter. And if I add it to the right, it's just going to make it darker and add black. As someone who's struggled with color grading and kind of color balance for matching people's faces for things like YouTube thumbnails and stuff, this tool has come in super clutch of actually getting those right tones to match out the different faces in the thumbnails if they're taken from different places or different pictures from the internet and stuff. And now talking about thumbnails specifically as well, if you combine this with the layer mask, this is what allows you to change the colors of certain parts of the image. So for example, I'll use one selective color adjustment layer just to adjust people's eyes and teeth in a, in a thumbnail. And then I'll do another one just to adjust the kind of overall colors and their skin tones and their clothes and that kind of stuff. And masking them to those parts of the body is what allows you to create those really, really cool effects. But yeah, it's just a really super cool tool for editing color and you should definitely give it a try. So for number four, it's going to be using the blend if feature on Photoshop layers. Now, I'm sure you all know about the layer styles panel and the different effects and stuff you can apply to a layer like that. However, did you know if you open up that same layer styles panel at the top, you've got blending options. Now, this opens up two little sliders under the blend if tab. And these are what we're going to be used to blend different layers together. Now, you can use these pretty creatively. There's probably some better tutorials to show actually how to use this property. But essentially, the top slider is the current layer. It blends the current layer to kind of like changes the opacity of parts of the image based on the brightness. And how it works is you drag the slider on the right, which is the whites to the left. Anything white will turn transparent. You can hold left alt or option if you're on Mac to split these apart and kind of fade that blend so it doesn't look so pixelated and have really jagged edges. And you can do the same with the blacks. Now, what this allows you to do and why it's so useful is sometimes you might want a PNG and it's got a white background or you might want to have a blend and overlay but some of the actual blending modes aren't just quite doing it for you. And what you can do, slap that overlay on Photoshop, paste it in there, open up the layer styles, click on blending options and just drag the blacks up to, from the right. They're a bit more in the center of the slider and then split them apart to kind of flay it and blend it nicely. And then you've got your own kind of overlay really nicely blended into Photoshop. That was a bit of a quicker one. There are definitely some more tutorials on, on YouTube that will show how to use this property more creatively, but it's just a cool feature to know how to use. So moving on to number five, and this is going to be learning keyboard shortcuts. Now, I can't cover them all in this video because there are honestly just so many. I might make a separate video on them. If you want to see that, leave a like and a comment on the video telling me, and I'll be sure to make that. But I'm just going to share with you some of the more unique ones and some of the ones that I use that honestly help speed up my workflow quite a bit. So my advice to you would be go and learn some of the keyboard shortcuts just to toggle between tools for a start. That will speed up your workflow. And see some of them that I know off the top of my head, like M for the marquee tool, B for the brush tool, V just to get the normal selection tool back up. And on the selection tool, if you come up to the top here while you've got the selection tool selected, I notice there's a box that says auto select. Now it's up to your preference if you want this on or off. If you have auto select ticked, what this means is if you just click on a layer and drag it around, it will select that layer and move it. However, how I personally have it set up, I have this box unticked and then I use control to click on the layer to actually go and select that and find where it is within my composition. And then I can just drag from anywhere and move it around my canvas. That's just how I like to work. You can work the inverse of that if you want it that way. While selected on the brush tool, which is B to switch to the brush tool. If you hold Alt and right click, if you drag to the right, it's going to make your brush bigger. If you drag to the left, it's going to make your brush smaller. Dragging up and down is going to change the hardness of your brush. So basically how kind of feathered the edge of the brush is. If you want a really hard round brush, then you can drag downwards. And if you want a really soft feathered brush, then you can drag upwards. And then if you want to save your work and you're doing it for digital stuff, so you're doing it for web or anything like that, you can use Shift, Control and Alt S to bring up the Save for Web Legacy panel where you can save your image as a JPEG or a PNG or however you'd like to save it. Or if you just want to save your document somewhere, you can do Shift, Control and S. And this will allow you to save as and save as wherever you like. Now, this is just scratching the surface of some shortcuts within Photoshop. Obviously, there's tons and tons you could learn. You can even set up your own if you go to edit and preferences. However, learning shortcuts is honestly going to speed up your workflow and you're going to wish you learned them sooner if you don't know them already. But yeah, I think that just about wraps up this video, guys. Let me know what you thought of this style of content. It's slightly different to what the kind of normal videos that I kind of make. Let me know if you found this helpful or not by leaving a like on the video and just showing some support, dropping a comment. Tell me how you thought it was. As always, my socials have been popping up on screen throughout the video and they're in the description down below but other than that thank you for watching and i'll catch you in the next video